You would think that at 52 years old, I would not wrestle with questions like, am I enough? Am I good enough? Am I doing enough? But I often do so. And maybe some of you can relate to that. As a follower of Jesus, I need to be reminded that simply abiding in the love of the Father is enough when it comes to my value. The problem is that in our culture, our culture says something completely different. Almost everything in life teaches you that you have to be good enough and busy in order to be considered valuable. It starts early when we're little children, and it keeps going. In the book, The Search for Significance, Robert S. McGee writes that the lie we are led to believe is that self-worth equals performance plus others' opinions. When we put our lives in that equation, we will never feel like we're enough. We will never feel like our lives are enough. For example, remember when you were a kid, then this never happened to me, but some of you may have gotten picked last for the team on the playground, right? For, it basically says, I'm not athletic enough. Or you try out for the school play and don't get a part, which means I'm not talented enough. You interview for, interview for the job and don't get it, that equals I'm not qualified. You get a bad performance review at work and get laid off, it means I'm useless. Your life is not packed with activity, which might mean I'm lazy. You don't work long hours and late hours, which means I'm not doing enough for the company. Eugene Peterson puts it like this. We get labeled early and frequently in non-relational terms. First grader, smart, cute, average, short, second string. I call him not here, I'd say third string, but he's not here. Uh, second string, as we enter adulthood, Non-relational labels continue. And he goes on to say, these labels are inevitable and in many ways useful. But the common element to them all is that they are impersonal, impersonal and partial. When they become all-encompassing, they distort our core identity. Robert S. McGee goes on to say that the correct formula to see our lives through is your worth equals what God says is true about you. Let me say that again. Your worth is equal what God says is true about you. For the follower of Christ, life is defined by a different label that has nothing to do with how good you perform or how much you do. The label is love. We are loved by the Father in heaven and is all we need to be enough. But what if we think that we have God's disapproval? Now we carry a mark like Cain. Or Nathaniel Hawthorne's scarlet letter that indicated that we are rejected and scorned by God himself. If we believe that God condemns us and does not love us, then it will be difficult for us to love other people. In our pursuit to make followers of Jesus, central to our task is helping people to live by that truth of John 15, 9. As Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Consider this morning, we're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 to 21, in how we are reconciled to God. And what I want to do this morning is I want to prove to you what God says about you. Amen? So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. We're going to read actually verse 16, but we'll hit verse 14 and 15 later. But look in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 16. I want to read through 21. This is good stuff. I, this is probably one of my favorite passages in all the Bible. Okay? Verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world 
to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting us to the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that we might, that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. I want to point out four things to you out of this. Number one is the word reconcile. To reconcile something. And I looked this up. To reconcile something means to bring two or more parties in agreement of peace to each other. So you have two, two things that are in conflict with each other. And to reconcile it, you've got to make them both agree. Right? You've got to bring them to agreement. And that's what reconciling is. It says God in Christ was reconciling the world to himself. We've got to understand that there was a conflict between God and man. There's a conflict that God had to reconcile. That conflict, the Bible calls it sin. The Bible says we have sinned, all have sinned against God. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What that means is all of us, all humanity, we have fallen short of God's glory. What that means is we, don't, we have not attained the perfection that God has designed for us to attain to. None of us are perfect like God. In order for any of us to get into heaven this morning, we've got to be perfect as God is perfect. And the Bible tells us that no one is perfect. Now, there's one who was perfect, and that was Jesus. But none of us are perfect. And so all of us, because of that, the Bible says the wage of sin is death. Because of that, we have been condemned to die for our sins, for all of eternity. And the Bible says we've all broke the law, right? We broke the law. The Bible says we have uh, the Ten Commandments. We've all told lies. We've all blasphemed God's name. We've broken the Sabbath. We've dishonored our parents. Somewhere down the line, if you look at your life, you'll see that you are a sinner. You have sinned. And because you sinned, you are in trouble with God. In order to have God let you into his heaven, you're going to be perfect. You're going to have to have sinless. And the problem is none of us are sinless. So how does God reconcile us to himself, seeing that we're sinful and he's holy and pure? I want you to look at verse 21. This is how he did it. And we sang that song. I like that because it's the verse in that song. As for our sake, he made him. Who's him? Who's he and him? He, God, God the Father, made him Jesus Christ. So God made Jesus, says, for our sake, God made Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What happened, what this verse is saying, is that Jesus had never sinned in his life. He was perfectly innocent. And what God has done, he has taken all the sin that's on me, and he transferred my sin and placed it upon Jesus. So that Jesus, he's now a sinner. He's never sinned a single sin in his life. But Jesus is a sinner, and because he's a sinner, he was condemned as a sinner, and he died as a sinner. Did Jesus deserve to die as a sinner? No, because he never sinned. The, the sin that Jesus had in his life, in, his, in that moment before he went on the cross, was not his own sins. It was my sins. And it was your sins. That's what he's saying. He who knew no sin, he became sin for us. So when Jesus died on the cross, when he died, my sin died. When he died, my penalty suffered my death penalty. He earned in him the consequence of my sin. Okay. Now, on the flip side, he says that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And what we have, Jesus, as, as my sin was transferred to Jesus, Jesus' righteousness was transferred to me. You see that? I get his perfection. I get his, his place on me so that when I die, I get something I didn't deserve. 
I get heaven. I have a relationship with the Father. And I can pray now as a son and a child of God. Why? Not because of my own righteousness, but because of the righteousness that's been placed on me. Do you understand this? See, if I if I'm going to sit here and pray to God by my own goodness, I'm not going to, it's not going to happen. My own goodness will get me to die on the cross, to get me to die and go to hell. But I don't want my own goodness. Because my own goodness is not good enough. Right? In myself, I am not good enough. But Jesus is in me now. And he is good enough. My assurance of going to heaven, my assurance is not because I'm good enough. Because I can do ever do any, anything good enough. I will never do good enough. My assurance of entering heaven is because I have Jesus' goodness on me. And Jesus had my badness on him. So when he died, I already went to hell. Somebody, tell, somebody would come up to me and say, go to hell. You know what I'll tell them? I've already been there. Jesus died for me. and He went to hell for me on the cross. It's already been paid for. It's done. That's the gospel. You don't have to go to hell for your own sins. And you can go to heaven because of what Jesus has done. He offers you his righteousness. He offers it to you freely. We just receive it. And that's what he said. That's how God reconciles us. In the Old Testament, time and time again, God gave the Israelites a second chance. Oh, they screwed that up. He gave them another second chance. Oh, they screwed that up. You read the Old Testament. From Genesis to Malachi, you'll find that the Israelites mess it up over and over and over again. Constantly. That's what humanity will do. When God gives them a second chance, he, they will always mess it up. And people say, God, has he got a second chance? I don't want a God a second chance. If you give me a second chance, I'm going to screw it up every single time. God, I'm, what am I going to do? I'm going to mess up the second chance you give me. So I want you to do something different so that it will work. And God says, I will do something different that will work. I will put my own righteousness in you. I'll bet on my own self. And I will succeed where you will fail. And so he sends Jesus to die on the cross and to raise him from the dead. So we have reconciled, we're reconciled, but we're, what God does is he switches places. There's a switcheroo, right? It says, for our sake he made him be sin, who knew no sin, says that in him we might become the righteousness of God. I remember sharing the gospel with somebody who says, in order to get to heaven, you have to be perfect as God is perfect. He looks at me and says, you're not perfect. No one's perfect. I said, that's right. No one. You've got to come to that place where you realize you're not perfect. You can't do it. Because only in that moment will you ask Christ to forgive you of your sins. And you will ask Jesus to come into your life. Until then, you're going to think you've you got it. You can do it. You can work harder. You, you can try harder. You're going to do as hard as you can. And maybe God will accept you. I'm going to tell you, if you're working that way, God won't accept you. Because your, your righteousness are filthy rags before God. And God will not accept it. Only his own righteousness in you will not accept it. Now look what he says in verse 17. He says in verse 17. It's pretty cool. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the news has come. See that? If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. <laughs> you know, some people think that eternal life begins when we get to heaven. <coughs> Did you know that's not true? Eternal life begins the moment you come to faith in Jesus. Because it's in that moment, old things have passed away. New things have come. You know what I'm saying? It's in that moment you enter into eternal life. I was six years old when I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. It's in that moment I entered into eternal life. See, God, in, in Revelation chapter, I do believe it's chapter 21, Revelation chapter 21, God, God says, the, the scripture says, Behold, uh, the new heaven and new earth. I saw a new heaven and new earth. The old earth... Old heaven and old earth were passed away. 
We're done away. God made a new heaven and new earth. God made a new place. But I'm going to tell you, God doesn't begin with the place. He begins with the people. And what he does is, with, through Jesus, when we invite Christ in our life, we become totally new. So that we're like the new heaven and earth. We're new people. Totally new. But let me say this. If you can lose your salvation today, you can lose your salvation when you get to heaven. Because your heaven starts today. When you've invited Christ in your life, you have been changed. You have fundamentally been changed from death. You have passed from death and to life. You've been changed. I heard someone say one time, can you unscramble an egg? Can you unscramble? Can you unfry an egg? Now, I have never unfried an egg. Now, I can take an ice cube, and I can thaw the ice cube becomes water and make it ice again. But, but we're talking about changing something, right? When you fry an egg... It's fried. It's done. You put it, you put it on the table all day long. I've never seen an egg revert back to its former condition. And this is what happens when you and I are born again. We have been changed. We, old things are passed away. The new has come. If you seek that old life, it's dead. It's no longer there. It's like when we get to heaven. We'll be in heaven. 10,000 years in heaven. No one's going to want the old life. But let's say you say, I wonder what it was like. I don't know. It's not there anymore. It's gone. It's passed away. You see, when you come to faith in Jesus, the old sinful life, the old sinful self, the thing that would curse you, the thing that brings the curse on you, is gone, has been eradicated. Amen. And you are a new creature in Christ. I pray that God will open our eyes to this truth, who we are. Because the devil knows if you know who you are in Christ... He doesn't stand a chance. You're going to stand victorious. You're going to stand in that victory. And you're going to give him a black eye. You're going to step on his head. You're going to say, devil, go away. You, you have a future in hell, but I have a future with Christ forever. We're a new people. We will have a new place. We've been given righteousness by God. Now look at verse 14 to 15. Now that we see this, now that we see what Jesus has done for us, his death on the cross, his burial, and when he rose again from the dead, it tells us, for the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. As we look at Jesus as he died on the cross, and we look at Jesus as he was buried in the ground, and he was raised again from the dead, and realize he's the Son of God. And we see that he loved us this way. What he says is this, we should love him back. It should cause us to love him, because he loves us that much. The reason people don't love Jesus this way is because they don't realize he loves them that much. And you know, it's interesting. It's very difficult for us to love someone else. It's very difficult for us to love God in return if we have not received his love for us. It's hard to abide in his love when we haven't received his love for us. You know that Jesus says, I love you when he died on the cross. He did. He says, nothing, there's nothing you can do that make me love you any less. <coughs> And we have to, we have to, by faith, receive that love for ourselves. We have to come to that place and say, Lord, I, I, have, I can't do it. I'm not enough. But you are. And invite him into our life to receive his love. I think about the upper room. I'm going to turn there real quick. John 20. Thinking about Jesus' love. You know that night when Jesus was betrayed by, uh, by Judas, he was denied by Peter three times. Did you know that all of his disciples left, except for John? I think John was the only one who hung around. They all left him. They threw him under the bus. They, they left him. And you would think that the first thing after Jesus rose from dead, the first thing he would say to his disciples you dirty low belly worms. You guys, you, you yellow, yellow, you guys, that took, you ditched me. But you know, that, does, that isn't what happened. 
I'm going to read John, uh, real quick for you. John chapter 20, verse 19. Jesus says something different. When they're all gathered together, he says, on the evening of that day, every Sunday night, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. You see that? When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. It's the first words that Jesus told his disciples. The last time they saw him, they abandoned him. But the first words he see, says to them is, peace be with you. Now, Thomas wasn't with them, doubting Thomas. And they told him about it. And he said, well, unless I see you still hand to the side, I'm not going to believe. Ah, you guys, are a bunch of, you guys are a bunch of clowns. And so Jesus appears later. And look at what else he says. In verse 24, I think. He appears just for Thomas' sake. Now, now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. 